Apple family, um, we're going to do a sermon series for the next couple of weeks, obviously on Easter, because in two weeks it's Easter. And the scripture we're going to be looking at today is John, and we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. John 3, 16 through 21. You can look at your scriptures, or also I'm going to have the scriptures up on the screen. So if you want to save yourself some time, don't worry about it. Uh, but in this scripture, Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus who is a leader in the Jewish religion. He is a Pharisee, which were one of the leaders of leaders in the Jewish tradition. And they're having a discussion about eternal life. And where this scripture is very relevant for you and me is it really shares with us how we, too, have eternal life. So look at these God's words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he, was, he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light being Jesus has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out by God. Let's pray. Father God, as we continue to worship by diving into your word, I pray that you would protect me from preaching anything that is not your truth. We come here to fellowship with Jesus and to be further changed to become more like him through your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, next slide. Technology works when it works. This is a picture that's in the Sistine Chapel. It was, written, it was done by the famous artist Michelangelo. And what it shows is the classic fall of humanity. On the left-hand side, you see Adam and Eve, our four parents, perfect. They were created in the image of God. They were perfect. They had no sin. They had perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with one another, perfect relationship with creation itself. And then we know in the scriptures what happened. We know Satan, who formerly was the archangel Lucifer, who was the original sinner because he wanted to be like God, tempted Adam and Eve and said, eat this fruit and you will become like God, which is the root of sin, to become like God. And then our four parents, Adam and Eve, ceased to be perfect. They became sinful. And as C.S. Lewis said, then humanity and God had the great divorce. Because God, who is perfect and holy and righteous, he can't have a relationship with humanity that is imperfect and sinful and not righteous. That's the dilemma we're in. Now, if I just stop there, it's very pessimistic. And that goes to the main point of this sermon. Humanity must believe the gospel. Humanity must believe the gospel, which is the Easter message. Now, side note, gospel just means the account of. So I could tell you the gospel of how I ate Taco Bell last night, all right? But when we're referring to the gospel in the church community, we're referring to specifically Jesus and how he saves us. So we're going to look at three areas. We're going to look at the gospel defined and the gospel motivation of God. We're going to get, look at gospel denial. When you deny the gospel, what happens? And we're going to look at gospel belief. When you believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, what happens? So let's look at the first area, the gospel. John 3.16 outlines it. God's love. First part of 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. God loves the world. He created it. 
And God especially loves a special creation that he made in his own image. And what is that? Humanity. God loves his creation. And he loves humanity. And then we got to look at God's gift. What is God's gift? That he gave his only son. Who is that son? We know it's Jesus Christ. By the way, Jesus Christ's name sums it all. Jesus is derivative from the Old Testament name Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Christ is the official name of the promised ordained king. So Jesus, we know from John 1, who is he? He's, the, he's always been in existence. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's fully God. And he became fully man. God gave us himself through his son, Jesus Christ. So we see God's love, God's gift, and then God's faith. Continuing on in John 3, 16. That whoever believes in him, whoever believes that Jesus truly is God, and Jesus is the way to have a relationship with God, whoever you are, no matter what race or wealth or whatever, no matter who you are, if you believe in God, if you believe specifically in Jesus, that's how you have a relationship with God. And then the other area, God's benefit. When we have a relationship with God, what happens? We have eternal life. Humanity, when we originally created our four parents, Adam and Eve, we were not supposed to die. We were supposed to have a perfect relationship with God forever. Well, because of Jesus, we can have that perfect relationship with God forever. Let's look at the gospel motivation. Why did God do this? Well, we see in John's first part of 17, for God not, did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world. He sent Jesus not to condemn the world. So God's motivation for sending Jesus was not condemnation. Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. Very enthusiastic back here. I love it. All right, so it's not condemnation. But the motive, God's motivation of sending Jesus was grace. We see in John 17 continuing, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What is grace? Grace is is unmerited favor. Here's a picture of a soldier that I took off of Google, nobody here, doing a PT test. Here's what grace is. A soldier does his push-ups, he does the sit-ups, and he does the two-mile run, and he scores 30 points in each one. He fails it bad. But someone else took the APFT on his behalf, and he gets on his scorecard a 300. That, my friends, is the gospel. That is what Jesus does for us. That's grace, unmerited favor. So how do we apply these truths to our lives? We see that the gospel, the account of what God has done for us, we see his love, that's his primary motivation. We see the gift, he gives us the gift of himself through Jesus Christ. We see his faith. God pours out his Holy Spirit on us, and we all of a sudden realize, you know, this whole Jesus guy makes sense to me. And we see the benefit. The benefit is eternal life. And why does God do this? It's not condemnation, but it's grace. Here's why I want to point this out to you. Depending on what authority figures you've had in your life, especially as you're a child, is sometimes how we project God is. If you had really, really bad parents who are abusive or mean, we, you probably view God as just a big curmudgeon in the sky who's waiting to nix you when you do something bad. You know, or on the other end of that continuum, some of us just think God is just this super nice Santa Claus in the sky that we give him our little wish list every now and then and hopes he comes through. Friends, the challenge, the application is let God be God as defined in his scripture. And what he does is he loves us, he gives us the, faith, the gift of himself, he gives us his faith, the benefit of eternal life. It's based on not condemnation, but grace. So that's the gospel. Now let's look at gospel denial. What happens when we don't believe the gospel? This is the bad news, and then we're going to get to the good news again. So stay with me. Condemnation. 
John 3, 18. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name, the only name of the Son of God. Remember how I started with the picture of Adam and Eve, the great divorce? All of humanity since then has been sinful. We're imperfect. We're condemned already. Why? Because imperf imperfection cannot have a relationship with something that's perfect. We're condemned already. Not only are we condemned already, but in our sinful nature, we're lovers and doers of evil. John 3, 17, and this is the judgment. The light, who is Jesus, has come into the world and people love darkness. They love sin rather than the light because their works were evil. How do I believe in regeneration, meaning that God pours out the Holy Spirit and he changes our hearts from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh so that we accept Jesus? Because left to our sinful nature, we're not going to choose D Jesus. We're going to continue in our sinful way. We're lovers and doers of evil. Not only because we're lovers and doers of evil, in our sinful nature, our imperfect nature, we avoid Christ. John 3.20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and, do, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. I told us to the Bible study I teach at Christ Fit, if, I, if you truly knew my sin, you would not want me preaching to you. And if I truly knew your sin, I'd be too scared to come in here to preach. Right? Here's a picture of Martin Luther. Martin Luther in the 16th century was a great leader in the church. Um, this was taken actually by me and my wife in Eiselben, Germany. Uh, one four-day uh, weekend when we were stationed in Schweinfurt, Germany. We traced the life of Martin Luther all throughout Germany. It wasn't too far from where we lived. Luther, when he had become a believer, he became a priest. And he's still a young believer. And his very first Mass... He's performing halfway through the Mass, and all of a sudden it hit him. His sinful nature hit him. He goes, I don't love God. I hate him. And he left. Imagine if I did that. It would be really awkward. But that's what he did. Why? Because he was overwhelmed with his sinful nature. How do we apply these truths to our lives? Gospel denial is condemnation, lovers and doers of evil, and we avoid Christ. I want to talk to whoever is not a believer in this room, and only you know who you are. Don't waste any time. Accept Jesus as your Savior. Come to him. On the back of your bulletin, there's a bunch of leaders of this chapel next service. We would love to talk to you about it. Quit playing the game of trying to fix yourself because you can't. You, like all of us in this room, need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. So now let's look at gospel belief. Okay, that was the bad news. Let's look at the good news. Gospel belief. No condemnation. Very first part of verse 18. Whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. Friends, what Jesus did on the cross forgives you of past, present, and future sins. Well, how can he do that? Who does Jesus think he is? God, yes, Jesus is God. That's how he does it. Amen? You are forgiven of past, present, and and future sins. Therefore, there is no condemnation. This picture right here is Connie Dickerson. She was one of my high school teachers. She taught me Latin and French. And when I was 17, you know, you go on one of those school trips and see all of the Europe's greatest hits for like six weeks. She led me on this trip. And I learned a valuable lesson from her about the fact of no condemnation. There was one time her son Brad, and she shared this with a class, when I was in high school, was a teenager and did teenager stuff and got in really trouble. And she and her husband, Jim, went to pick Brad up. And Brad thought he was going to get grounded, thought he was going to get punished, thought they were just going to throw the book at him. And all they told him was, I love you anyway. Friends, if you're believers in this room right now, no matter what you do, because of Jesus, God loves you anyway. There's no condemnation. And because there's no condemnation, we're free to seek Christ and become more like him. John 3, 21. But whoever does what is true 
comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Friends, on this side of glory, we're still going to struggle with our sinful nature, but we are going to become more like Christ. Now, granted, it's going to be highs and lows like the stock market, but overall, you're becoming more like him, and when you're in glory, you will be like him. Amen? You will seek Christ, and you will become more like him. How do we apply these truths to our lives? No condemnation. If you're struggling constantly with guilt, I would submit to you that possibly Satan is using that to say this gospel really can't be true. Deny that. Because it is true. Don't have, you, you're free. You don't have any more condemnation because of Jesus. And you will become more and more like him. Next slide. Sermon review. So praise and worship team will come up. We're going to view a few things. What have we seen here this, this morning? Humanity must believe the gospel, the Easter message. We've seen the gospel defined. It's based on God's love, the gift of his son. We've seen his, uh, his faith, the benefit of eternal life. We've seen the motivation, not condemnation, but grace, unmerited favor. We've seen what happens if you deny the gospel. There's condemnation. You continue to be lovers and doers of evil. You avoid Christ. We see gospel belief. No condemnation. And you seek Christ. Here's the challenge I want to give to you for the next two weeks. Because you have a choice. For the next two weeks as we approach Easter and on Easter, you have a choice. On the upper left hand side, Easter can be about, for you about Easter bunnies and candy and Easter egg hunts and Cadbury eggs, which, by the way, are delicious, or peeps, which, by the way, are disgusting. You know? That's what your Easter can be about. Or you can do some of those things, but have your focus of Easter be on the right thing, and that is the bottom right corner. The fact that Jesus, who is fully God, became fully man, and he lived a life all of us should have, but we couldn't do it because of our sinful nature. And he died a death that all of us deserved because of our sin. And all we have to do is believe in him, and we are forever with God and his people. My friends, that's the gospel, and I hope you experience that gospel anew this Easter season. Let's close and praise him.